from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much for joining today's lecture by Thomas Burns uh, regarding his National Cherry Blossom Festival poster process. My name is Marina Kahara, the Curator for Architecture, Design and Engineering at the Library's Print and Photographs Division, and I also um, am the, uh, today's program coordinator. Uh, this program is one of the 2018 National Cherry Blossom Festival official events co-hosted by the library's Asian division, as well as prints and photographs division. The library began to participate in the National Cherry Blossom Festival starting from 2012, when we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Cherry Blossom Tree Gift from city of Tokyo to Washington, D.C. Since then, uh, we continue hosting events and programs uh, coinciding with the uh, National Cherry Blossom Spring um, event in uh, every year. So this is to pursue one of the library's goals of providing general understanding of American cultural, intellectual, and social life and of other peoples and nations. I'm hoping that um, these lectures and events will in the future inspire a greater interest in Japanese culture, the U.S.-Japan relationship, and also the library's diverse collections in the general public, including K-12 students. As a matter of fact, in addition to today's lecture, the library will host a K-12 program called Japanese Culture Day this Saturday, April, April 7th, between 10 to 3 at the Young Readers Center with the children's book author, Tad Hills, from New York City, as well as the Spring Fring, a pop-up exhibition exploring the sight, sound, and the smells of the spring season through treasures from the library's vast collections, including a host of cherry blossom related materials. The spring fling will be held on April 6th, 7th, 13th, and 14th between 10 to 4. Events are free of charge. I hope many of you can come back and enjoy these programs. The National Cherry Blossom Festival has been one of the internationally renowned events in DC. What I, as a curator for design, look forward to every year is an exquisite poster which is created by a selected designer. I gradually cultivated my dream to collect these posters as part of the Library of Congress collections and my curiosity to learn how each designer gets inspired to design the National Cherry Blossom poster has naturally grown. Today I'm extremely excited and pleased to invite Thomas Burns and introduce the National Cherry Blossom historical uh, posters generously donated by the National Cherry Blossom Festival Inc. last year. I believe you have already enjoyed five posters outside of this room, but we will be uh, showing the rest of the posters, historical posters, at the Prince and Photographs Reading Room after this lecture. The room is just around the corner. We will guide you where it is, so please attend and just enjoy the rest of the posters. Borrowing this opportunity, I would like to express my deep appreciation to Diana Mayfew, the president of the National Cherry Blossom Festival, and Lydia Anverson and their colleagues, and then also Martha Kennedy, my colleague and the curator of popular and applied graphic arts who collaborated with me to acquire these posters. Let me introduce Thomas Burns. Thomas Burns grew up in Gainesville, Florida, and received a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Graphic Design from the University of Florida. After pursuing an MBA in Supply Chain Management at Michigan State University, he relocated to Atlanta, Georgia 
to work for a major telecommunications company. Artistically, he remained unfulfilled and eventually created his own freelance studio in 2007. His illustrations are fun, whimsical, and richly detailed piece like this. He created a flyer to us <laughs> that still boasts a very handmade quality. His areas of expertise include editorial, advertising, and the children's illustrations. His work has been exhibited in New York, Los Angeles, and Atlanta. Mr. Burns is currently a professor of illustration at the Savannah College of Art and Design, Atlanta, Georgia. Finally, please join me in welcoming Thomas Burns. Thank you, Mari, and thank you to the library uh, for inviting me here. And thank you guys for coming out uh, to hear this little talk about this uh, process for the 2016 uh, poster for the National Cherry Blossom Festival. And I think Mari kind of went through my whole life. I have a little, like, yeah, I know. I had this little section about my background, so I'll go through it again. Um, let's see, though. It's like, okay, so this is me. <laughs> long, long ago when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. I'm, I'm way older than I look. <laughs> Um, I went to school and got a degree in graphic design uh, from the University of Florida. And you can see how happy I look there. <laughs> Coming out of school with my portfolio, I'm ready to go conquer the world and do some artwork. But my family said, you got to go get a real degree <laughs> in business because, and if you notice my expression starts to go a little <laughs> bit. Business is where it's at, you know, so you can, <laughs> you know, have a long, fulfilling life as an accountant or something like that. So I got a degree in supply chain management um, <laughs> from the University of, or Michigan State University, and I ended up working for the phone company, uh, and I kid you not, my little cubicle <laughs> was between the bathroom and the janitor's closet, and I did not see sunlight for eight hours a day. It was not fulfilling to me. Uh, so, of course, my solution is to go back to school and get another degree. So I got my MFA in illustration from um, SCAD, the Savannah College of Art and Design. They have an Atlanta campus, a Savannah campus, uh, and one in France, I think, and then Hong Kong. So you can see the expression changes. I'm much happier. I opened a little studio, started doing some freelance work, uh, a lot of advertising, packaging, um, some editorial stuff. And then I started teaching, and I grew this beard, uh, which I'll probably get rid of, and so now it's gone again. <laughs> okay, so that's just a little bit about me. <laughs> uh, so this was the type of work that I was doing uh, when I had my own little studio, um, kind of post-college, uh, graduate school. And you can see it. this is editorial stuff and then a little bit of children's stuff here, and it sort of has this kind of fun, whimsical feel to it, kind of brighter colors, and it's sort of rooted in kind of that mid-20th century aesthetic of, you know, Warner Brothers cartoons or Tex Avery or Hanna-Barbera and maybe a little bit of Mary Blair in there. If you're familiar with It's a Small World at Disney, uh, that's that sort of Mary Blair aesthetic. Uh, it's the 1950s. Uh, she was a 50s conceptual artist for uh, Disney World. Um, and I think this is what caught Lillian Iverson's eye. She's in the audience today. Hey, Lillian. <laughs> uh, the director of programming at the National Cherry Blossom Festival. Uh, and so she sent me an email, gave me a phone call, something like that, and said, hey, what do you think about doing the poster for this year's 2016, for this year's uh, Cherry Blossom Festival? I was like, oh, that sounds amazing. Let's do that. Um, so generally what happens in big projects like this is you get a creative brief. Uh, and part of the brief was, you know, they wanted to own springtime that was anchored in the annual flowering of the trees and retelling, uh, retelling the narrative of the awe-inspiring beauty of the, the trees in bloom. And then, of course, something that can be utilized on merchandise, you know, for that memory of participating. And how many people have had, have come to multiple cherry blossom festivals? More than 10, more than, more than, okay. <laughs> this is our second one, and it's just, it's fantastic. So, and thank you guys for the weather to, today <laughs> and tomorrow, but not so much on Saturday because it's supposed to snow. Is that right? Yeah. A lot of snow? Mm. Okay, so the way this starts for me, this process, is I go all old school, and I get into my sketchbook. Even though my work uh, is finished digitally, I do everything in the computer, 
Um, I love to get in my sketchbook with some pen and ink and paper and get down and dirty and use some traditional materials. And I'll do some word association stuff. You know, that's kind of for me just to kind of plot out the major points of, you know, what should be connected and the, the feeling and the ideas that should go into it. Uh, and then this is what my thumbnails look like. And you can see some of the cherry blossom thumbnails over on the right. The stuff on the left uh, could be something from an editorial project or any ideas that I've had that I just sort of try to get out of my head or get onto some paper. Otherwise, they tend to evaporate. And you're like, I had this great idea, but I don't remember what it was. So as long as it gets down on some paper and there's some record of it, uh, you know, you can sort of save it and work with it. And, you know, maybe you're working out some kind of... Uh, solution to some visual problem and these are just some more thumbnails you know there was this uh a project about frogs so i'm doing a lot of frogs and i'm trying to figure out what this frog is going to look like is he is he in a race is he you know what is he i don't know whatever <laughs> so much of frogs <laughs> okay so these are some of the beginning thumbnails uh for this poster that's out front um so they're really small they're maybe about an inch and a half big uh, they're pretty simple at this stage, but you can kind of tell exactly what's going on in each one of these. So there's the capital with the reflected cherry blossom and a little bit of typography, or maybe the capital's made out of flowers and cherry blossom. Or maybe there's the, the monuments with the, you know, blossoms coming out of it. Um, or the capital popping open an explosion of flowers, <laughs> which I, I thought was really cute. <laughs> and then maybe the typography ends up in the trees, you know, it's sort of woven into it, or there's a large flower with birds and caterpillars and uh, maybe some butterflies and ladybugs uh, and then some more little tiny ones. Just trying to work out what this is supposed to look like visually. So this is the one I really liked at the beginning stage. <laughs> she's, kind of, she's kind of laughing. She's like, because this is not what the final piece looked like. And I know there were a couple other illustrators maybe under consideration for this at this point. So I took this way beyond probably where it should have been. I took it almost to finish and I was like, this looks awesome. I got some hand type in here and there was a couple of color variations um, and showed this to Lillian. And I think I even mocked it up on some products. Do you know that? <laughs> I was like, this, I, this better happen. <laughs> so I was like, look, we can put on t-shirts and coffee cups and tote bags and keychains and all kinds of stuff. And I sent it off to Lillian and she was like, this looks great, except let's go back and do some more thumbnails. Because <laughs> uh, I don't know about the capital popping open and things exploding out of it, so that might be a little weird. So <laughs> we did some more thumbnails, some more exploration on this stuff. And these are just a little bit beyond what a thumbnail might be. It's, these are value comps. So I'm kind of working out you know, where the, the darks and the lights and the greens and the blues and that kind of stuff will go. Uh, so you can see this sort of swish that kind of comes out of the capital, and then the idea of that second one where it swishes around the capital and ends in that larger dominant flower, and then the third one where it switches to the Washington Monument, and then they, it, you can see the kind of difference between three and four where it's just a subtle difference between that. So the one that was picked out of here was this one, and I think that type actually ended up moving down lower. Um, so some basic design principles that go into even at the small size of these thumbnails. Um, this is like super design 101, the basic rule of thirds. So if you grid up something, you know, with three columns and three rows, uh, you can overlay it on a piece and kind of figure out where the major components of things are going to lay out. So you can see the buildings kind of lay out in that top third, you know, where those dots are, and the, the Washington Monument sits in the top third, and the swish comes down, and that type drops right in the middle, and it leads down to that larger nominate flower at the bottom. So really simple kind of stuff. And then another thing that's sort of working in this composition is the little S swish that goes through it, leads your eye all the way down to the bottom and then the V that kind of funnels you back down to the bottom again, too. So, you know, it's just this really basic design principles about how these things are constructed. And this is an example of another, another piece that has that swish that kind of runs through it, but it's really obvious in this piece. And then this one may be not so obvious. There's a lot of stuff happening in here, except, you know, you can see where this upside-down U and this top U kind of, the major piece of this sort of lay on those, those uh, arcs. And then maybe one more, you can see the X it just drops right in the middle, you know, sort of this two-point perspective kind of thing. So this stems from my graphic design background of kind of, you know, wanting things to be organized and orderly. Not all my pieces, you know, end up like this, but as a structure to hang your hat on and do these pieces, it, it sort of facilitates the, the process. 
All right, so then here, this is actually the finished piece, I think, except maybe the type changed a little bit at the end. But then you can see, you know, how those, uh, the, the V sh shows up and the S shows up in that and funnels everything down to the bottom. And then, oops, let me go back one more. I'm getting ahead. And then you can also see there's one other little principle kind of happening in here is this sort of large, medium, and small idea. The large, one large dominant flower, a bunch of medium-sized ones, and then thousands of little teeny tiny flowers. So let's go forward. And I work in Adobe Illustrator. I'm sure you guys are familiar with Photoshop. Everyone's heard of Photoshop, and you can tweak things and change things. And Photoshop lends itself really well to mimicking traditional media. So you can plug in all these brushes and emulate oil painting or watercolor or charcoal or pencil or that kind of stuff and get this sort of really hand-done traditional look to something. Adobe Illustrator works a little bit differently and it's heavily used in the graphic design world, which is my background. And if you think about it, Adobe Illustrator works almost like cut paper. So all these little things are layers of paper and they can all be repositioned and resized and tweaked and turned and manipulated. Um, and I'll go forward. So this is what all the pieces start to look like when I'm designing them. And then they can all sort of be overlaid. So you can see that green swish that runs through that. It looks kind of like cut paper. It has that flat look to it. And there's thousands and thousands of layers of pieces of that cut paper in here. And you can see the buildings when I pulled them apart here. You know, they're not completely finished because if I go back, they're hidden behind some other things. But there's actually a little bit more to the, the buildings and the pieces. Um, and Adobe Illustrator is very, you can manipulate things and kind of move the flowers around and make sure there's no tangents when things touch each other in awkward ways or there's, you know, two pink flowers next to each other that look like they blend into each other. So you, you have a lot of precision and a lot of control over it. Maybe not so much like in Photoshop or traditional media where once you put that mark down and you kind of blend it with other pieces, it's harder to kind of manipulate it and move it around. And then some typography was being considered uh, during this process um, and some little animals snuck into it some little birds and butterflies uh, the capital snuck into that bottom right one <laughs> I don't think any of this got yet well maybe the middle one kind of got considered near the end so then this was sort of laid out on these uh, the the major swish thing where the type went it kind of moves around and then I think that's the, the fun that's the that's your regular logo right um, so then the building process of this whole thing so there's the finished piece so if I'm starting with all that cut paper I lay down my sky first and add the buildings <laughs> and then started adding the, the green river of spring and then a bunch of flowers and then it's a little more tiny yeah you can see it's a kind of a tiny little there's just more stuff and leaves kind of adding in the background and sort of fills it out and then some butterflies it's animated it's not animated <laughs> I'm just flicking the button and okay and then the big flower ends up at the end and then there's a subtle shift here uh, and I'll talk about that in a second where you can see right around the clouds and maybe in the green area where some texture ends up in there and I do bring this into Photoshop at the end and then there's a color shift here and some of that typography ends up at the bottom and then that's sort of the finished piece um, and this is sort of a blown up detail of that and you can see I bring this into Photoshop and use some of those uh, more traditional brushes that emulate splatters and gouache and oil paint. You can see a little bit of that down in the corner and then it's ending up on the flower. And it sort of takes away that really clean, sterile graphic design look to it uh, and gives it a more, you know, sort of humanistic, uh, traditional feel to it. And one of the final pieces to that is I will slip a piece of old vintage paper behind the entire piece and you can see on the right that's just a little section of it and it's you know something out of a book like an end paper out of a discarded book from the library or an old comic book that you know has a section that has some speckle tone to it and is yellowed and it's aged and that slips behind everything and I let it kind of peek through the entire design and you can see that texture on the flower and kind of sit behind in the the green area and the cherry and the um, yeah I guess on the flower and the little green area in the back so then there's the final design. I think it's close, except for the type at the bottom. <laughs> so, and then I do want to mention that I do uh, teach at SCAD, the Savannah College of Art and Design. They have a campus in Atlanta, and I've been there about five years. 
Uh, and I always tell the students that this is like Hogwarts. It's a magical place. I know because they, they come in and, you know, they're just drawing and they're making magical things. And I tend to get them right at the end of their career there. I teach graduate students and undergrads, but sort of seniors and high juniors. So they've kind of gone through all their techniques classes and they've learned oil pastels and watercolors and you know all their perspective drawing and their life drawing and then I get them when it starts to the application stage so we're doing posters I teach posters and advertising illustration and editorial illustration and children's book il illustration um, and let's see and this is what a typical classroom looks like uh, we have like meeting rooms and tables kind of like you would have in a small agency or um, like a, a bigger company and then there's workstations uh, behind and other classrooms have traditional media tables to get down and dirty with the, the actual physical things and we just have such a good time sitting there and talking about this stuff and doing stuff and and honestly I may learn more from them than I teach them I don't, I don't know but at some point I'm just like oh that looks great I'm writing it down like <laughs> how, did, how did they do that I don't <laughs> um so I guess that's about it. That sort of sums up the whole idea of how that thing is created and I guess where I came from. And I would like to thank Mari and the Library of Congress and Lillian and my family and you guys for coming out for this. <laughs> Sorry. Did I... <laughs> did I talk too fast? <laughs> yeah, so now if you guys have any questions, have I will plenty, plenty of questions. Plenty of questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> how far in advance? Are you actually approached about this? Was it maybe about a, a year? Maybe? Usually right over the summer or late at the latest, early fall of the, pre of the previous year or the festival that's still coming. So, so it was... 2016, I think I reached out to you about July. Or July of 15, yeah. Because a lot of stuff had to be done by fall of <laughs> 15, right? Right. So right. Like for, yeah, to get printed and uh, advertising the website and that kind of stuff, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think when we started doing this, I had a bunch of those animals in there, and you're like, no, we did animals last year. So they, right. more about the flowers and the green and the, yeah, explosion, the river of flowers, so. Right, I'm trying to think what we're looking at here, too. I mean, is that still celebrating parks and nature or whatnot? There might have been. There might have been, yeah. Might have been using to help steer some programming and might have, and, and you know, proposed it as is. There's a way that that comes across without being explicit, and we walked out of there. And so then all of that gets reviewed a little bit in the thumbnail phase. Right. So that all sort of gets weeded out. More, more questions? <laughs> yes. What, can you talk a little bit more about the, the client-artist relationship, this back and forth? Like you have this idea in the Lego, uh, and then you have another idea. Yeah. Like, what, is, <laughs> what is that like? Like what is going on there? And, you know, and how many people are you dealing with? Are you just dealing with one person? Or right. Are you Right, right, right. Oh, absolutely. Um, and but it depends on the client. So in the editorial world, um, something that turns around really quickly, like for newspapers or maybe even magazines, it may have a couple days or a couple weeks of, of turnaround. Uh, generally, those art directors they say we have this idea, give me some thumbnails, and then we'll pick one and then just go and do it. But you get into the book world or the advertising world, and there's longer lead times, uh, especially in the book world and advertising there'll be committees of people. And so the, there may be 
uh, a couple steps to get to that. So you present a lot of thumbnails and it goes to maybe an art director and they take it back to a creative team and then they look at it and so you, they get a lot more input. Uh, and so things can get steered by committees and then that's where that compromise may come in, you know, where you, you say, I really like these colors or the way this type fits together. Um, and then someone else has another idea, some graphic designer on the other end, and then you start this sort of, you know, kind of juxtaposition of how these things work and you got to start doing a lot of give and take with that. And so it really depends on the client, uh, the editorial world, which is very fast. I, I like working in that. So someone gives me an idea idea the thumbnails come out and you know honestly i think giving them a lot of options up front so that's why you can see that in my my sketchbook where there's tons of thumbnails and i really enjoy doing that long ago and i tell my students this all the time because they'll come in with like maybe a couple little pencil sketches with a stick figure or something like you need to do more thumbnails and they're like oh we hate them i just want to do the final project so long ago i was like that uh, but then i grew to love making thumbnails and working out those little you know the little uh I guess the compositions at that small scale and then that's almost like the roadmap for the bigger thing and you know the the final piece becomes easier to do so i don't know if that answered your question or not but <laughs> so yeah it depends on who what the client or what industry you're working for well i may i may want to ask a little more further detail for instance i did the architectural design and as an architect that we have certain things Oh, you like this one, but structure-wise, it doesn't work. Right. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And we have kind of a weapon that push them back. <laughs> <laughs> them back. What is the, your field that you want to push your idea front and then just let them back, back up? What, what would be the weapon to you? <laughs> <laughs> the weapon. <laughs> you hired me. I'm the expert. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, but you can't phrase it that way. You just like, you know... You have to be really diplomatic about it and say, you know, uh, aesthetically, and, and there's some reasoning behind it. So I sort of showed you the really basic design principles. So you can use that as a weapon to, you know, back up why you're doing things. And then you can always use other weapons of, you know, like color palettes and consistency and how type works. And you can lay out some good reasoning about why something works, you know. And if it's somebody who doesn't have as much experience, you know, you can kind of argue against it. But, you know, at some point you want to make the client happy. And you, 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 there's some compromise at, at a point. Principles. It is, yeah, yeah. And you, you talk about the basic principles, and that you know it's hard to argue against that. Say, well, this layout looks really nice, and it sort of follows this rule of thirds. And they're like, oh, okay, you know, so <laughs> you got me there. You know, I don't know. <laughs> do they try to micromanage you that? Like, some do, yeah. Take that out. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and that's you know whatever art director you're dealing with some are very loose and some are very micromanagey and um you either like that or dislike that and if you don't want to work with somebody you know that super micromanage you can you know say thanks but no thanks you know um i'm i can i have a high tolerance of <laughs> you know open projects versus really closed and tightly done projects and I, I tend to give my students like really structured tightly bound projects and then really open projects and some of them I just hate the open projects there. Like, I want the structure. I want the micromanaging. Or some go the absolute other way. I want the micro, you know, the, the little tightly bound thing. So, yeah, it, it depends. <laughs> so it always depends. <laughs> More questions. Yes. Yes, so all those little tiny little flowers all drawn by hand. And I know there there could be the, um, the impetus to sort of like cut and paste and sort of make a thousand of the same flower. But then you can really kind of tell that somebody cut and pasted and didn't, you know, do every little flower by hand. Uh, it just looks more natural and doesn't look as, you know, artificial. So, yeah, all those little pieces, all the little pieces of the monuments, the little dots, the little dashes, uh, the butterflies, the bees, and all that stuff is all hand done. And then, since it's so manipulative that you can, you know, rearrange everything to the thousandths of an inch and manipulate and turn it and rotate it. Uh, I just I like that precision. So yes. So are, are they scanned? They're not scanned. Um, going from that thumbnail stage, the little pen and ink stuff. Sometimes I'll scan that in and put it next to the artboard in Adobe Illustrator, and then just sort of use that as a reference guide. I know other people will lay that underneath the artboard 
and draw over it because they, they want to draw over exactly what they did by hand. I tend to be a little bit more loosey-goosey about it and just sort of start tweaking things and manipulating things. So that thumbnail is by no means the absolute, you know, Bible of how that thing is going to play out. Yes. Right. Can you talk about it like that? Why that's like that one, that little ship. Um, I think there was another one that looked like a pill next right. to it. Right. And that's just, you know, a straight up editorial image, like right in the middle. I mean, that ship has a nice diagonal to it. So right. instead of, you know, dropping it on a horizontal, which is less interesting than a diagonal, um, th- that's just sort of giving that particular piece some something a little bit more that's unexpected. And it's not that hard to you know, tweak it on a diagonal. The little pill one, and I can maybe go back to those really quick. Let's have the lecture again. <laughs> in reverse. Uh, I didn't memorize it in reverse. <laughs> uh, keep doing it. <laughs> and so close. I feel like there. <laughs> yeah, and that pill house um, was about sort of addiction in the suburbs a little editorial piece and again it has a little diagonal to it it could have been straight on um, but that definitely does not play into that rule of thirds um, it just it's a it is what it is kind of piece and that's something that might end up in a a magazine at about a quarter size illustration uh, or a half a page uh, i think this one was a half a page uh, you know and then at some point you you know you can rely on these rule of thirds and these sort of structures and at some point you can do what you, you can break the rules and do what you want with it um and some of my students come in and they've already broken the rules and they're right in the middle of that pill house with just one little image in the middle and you know you first start doing this stuff with the the v's and the s's and the x's and then then you can get to that depending on the project and you know what it calls for and i don't think that needed anything more to it it's it's communicating some kind of editorial concept yes In, in that world, yeah. yeah. And, you know, you would kind of think, like the computers are everywhere, and, you know, people just want to jump on the computer and start doing stuff. And that's absolutely not the case where I'm at and what I'm seeing. There's tons of students that, you know, want to get the watercolors out and get gouache paint out and oh. do stuff with colored pencil. And what's kind of weird, I'm seeing some cut paper, some real cut paper, not this Adobe <laughs> Illustrator cut paper, and they're cutting stuff out and they're gluing things together, and it's very tactile. Um, very handmade and then at some point you know those handmade things get into the computer because then you can shift colors around way easier or, or change something or add typography to it uh, but I'm seeing sort of a 50-50 and at, at SCAD we teach uh, all this sort of traditional media first and then not, not that these students aren't coming in with you know Photoshop skills but then they see how these things work together it's just another tool to use and it can answer this traditional media and I think, you know, sort of out in the marketplace, that traditional media is, is prized. And you'll see stuff like that on Etsy and all these, you know, websites where you see the crocheted stuff or the knitted stuff or the hand calligraphy. Um, but then at some point it has to go digital to be dispersed into the larger market. Or if it stays in that handmade stage, you know, it, it becomes this sort of more important, almost artist like artist books or paintings or that kind of thing that has more weight to it so i'm definitely seeing both and that's maybe why i love getting in the sketchbook and doing pen and ink uh, up front so i still have my feet in both worlds um, and i think a lot of the students learn that eventually like oh i can use the computer but then i want to work traditionally on this project and i want to work digitally on this project so i'm definitely seeing both and i think that may be a reaction uh to Probably around 2000, when computers were becoming more prevalent in the design and illustration process, everyone wanted to be on the computer. Everything was going to be computerized in the future. And so then everything sort of had this sort of computer-y look to it. 
Uh, and then it's sort of swung back the other way where you'll see a lot of the hand done lettering. So people are prizing that more tactile feel to it, more traditional look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So traditional stuff. Yeah, just like almost like vinyl has come back. You know, I, I bought a turntable recently and I'm like, I keep buying these records. I'm like, this is so old school because every all music is available everywhere on the Internet. But I'm listening to records. And that was because of my daughter who got a record player. <laughs> I do, and yeah, yeah, we, we look at them, you know, throughout the whole class, just seeing what they're doing, and, and some are amazing, and some are not so amazing. <laughs> well, you know, and I, and I get that, you know, because some people think, that, or some students think, well, you know, why do I have to get in here? I just want to get on the computer, and then some just love just sitting and drawing, and it's cathartic, and it's relaxing, and you can sort of get in the zen moment, and I, have, I do that in my sketchbook with the pen, and, so I'll do everything in pencil first, and then I go over it with a rapidograph pen or... Uh, a little Tombow pen or something. And it's relaxing for me, and you can kind of take some time to start inking it, and then you're thinking about the next thing, you know, that you're going to draw. But, you know, you're sort of automatically doing this, and Netflix is on, or music is on, and then you move on to the next sketch in pencil. So, yes, I have them turn in sketchbooks and look through sketchbooks, and um, we talk about them and the importance of thumbnails and doing stuff, you know, tactilely and traditionally. Yeah, absolutely. I'm here. <laughs> so that was super cool, right? <laughs> and it's the second time we've been here. I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> um, life changing. I, I, you know, it's, I, this is a big deal to have something, you know, nationally recognized like that and then to be in the collection. Um, I don't know. It makes me feel amazing that it's sort of legitimized as, a, as an illustrator and artist. Um, I, I'm super appreciative, you know, of the uh, chance to do that and to come here and speak about that. Um, I, I don't know. I just, it's, I mean, did your name get out more? Was it like, are you getting more offers? Um, you know, it's hard to say if that's how people find it because it's always such a interesting path about how people find you as an illustrator. Like magazines, uh, art directors will find you because they saw an editorial piece or a poster or somewhere else. And I, I don't know if I specifically ask all the time, but I'm sure that absolutely has something to do with the, a larger awareness and sort of marketing of yourself so yeah i would say yes can you speak to the time involved in even just the creation of one of those flowers on the poster and manipulating that program uh yes <laughs> uh, you know those little flowers may take I mean, since they're all sort of different and you kind of get into a rhythm of making them, they may take a, a minute or two or like that bigger one that had some more dots and squiggles that might take three or four or five or ten minutes to kind of just to kind of get it right. You know, uh, you can draw it and then it's like, well, this curve doesn't look so perfect and you refine it a little bit and then you lay down some dots and well this dark pink is right next to another dark pink let's shrink it let's move it and so it just gets really manipulative like that so you know there's and that three or four minutes adds up for the amount of those little flowers that are in there so then it starts going into hours and hours and then sort of designing that swish of the river that sits behind it and making sure those flowers don't run over any awkward spots and the green shows through in all the right areas um, so, you know, things like the little thumbnails and kind of drawing those might take two or three or four minutes to kind of get some of those and you can do an hour or two hours worth of that. And then the flowers start getting into the hours and hours and then the tweaking and the moving starts getting to more and more hours. And, um, then you're at 10, 15, 20 hours and then, I don't know, 30 hours with the paper and the texture and then, yeah, it just keeps building cumulatively. So yeah, it, but to me, that's what I like doing, so it doesn't seem like it's taking a lot of time. Um, you know, anything that you really enjoy doing, you're like, this isn't work to me. I just love drawing flowers and buildings and swishes and, you know, birds and bees and things like that. So, yes? For somebody who got stuck in a real cherry blossom traffic, oh. <laughs> We'll go all the way through it again, and we'll have the lecture again. Sure. Wait, 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 one more. Yes. I 
was um, putting your poster lovingly back in our reading room at the top <laughs> of your talk, so forgive me if you already mentioned this, but were there um, artists who influenced you early on? Are there artists that you really love today? Oh, definitely. Um, and I did kind of go through that, that a lot of my art was influenced by sort of that mid 20th century, the cartoon world, yeah. that Hanna-Barbera, the Tex Avery, you know, those the 1960s ish Bugs Bunny that had that kind of wonky line work and the really loosey goosey color. Maybe not so much the 30s and 40s uh, Warner Brothers stuff. That and then. Poster shows that, that you showed yeah, on. absolutely. And you can totally <laughs> see that popping through. And then even like people like Mary Blair. I don't know. Do you know? She was a concept artist for Disney. Like in the. And think of. Um, Cinderella, and she did all this sort of gouache painting that has this really light, loosey feel to it. Uh, and then if you've ever been on It's a Small World at Disney World, and that kind of really geometric kind of fun kind of aesthetic of the mid-century is her. her. So you're kind of familiar with it in some level. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to also mention that we had, um, we've had students who come here and draw looking at the collection for inspiration. We had Pixar folks here, oh, and they yeah. had both sketchbooks and tablets going, you know, they were, yeah. they were doing all of it. It's just another tool. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yes. On these, do you get to autograph these, or are they largely anonymous? And is, is there anything you can do? You know, would I, would I know this is yours? Is there a hidden signature that you have worked <laughs> in here? Is there... Like the Hirschfeld <laughs> has this Dina's. And, how, uh, how, do you, how do you not be anonymous? How, how do you? You'll see a lot of B shapes in here for burn. No, I don't. I didn't. I didn't. Every flower. No. I don't. I don't think I snuck anything in here. But at some point, there was some autographing of the actual prints, uh, the posters. Um, but I don't think I put anything in there. Oh, is it? It might be on the yeah. side. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So an after that, but nothing hidden in there that I'll tell you about. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Because <laughs> because Lillian's here now. <laughs> How dare he? Yes. Can you cross your eyes and we'll yeah. see the tablet? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, in the back. <laughs> So many art history classes. <laughs> I, th I think I have an entire PhD in art history. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, and it was you know in undergrad and in graduate school they they give you lots of you get know, Italian Renaissance and Greek and Roman and Baroque and all that kind of stuff. So that you know influences you in some base level. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so the world is sort of moving towards that of these things having at least some motion. So I actually teach a class called uh, Dynamic Publication, which is turning editorial pieces into little animated GIFs. So it adds just that next little time. We're not doing full-on you know, Pixar animation, but to illustrate a point, something else happens. Like that little ship would snake a little bit around that iceberg, and it might bump into it and move back. And you know, just something like that to kind of show that it reinforces the point of that that concept. So, yeah, I've done a little bit of that. I haven't done any, like, super professional work for magazines or digital magazines like that, but just on my own I've done it. Um, and it's, it's a little bit newer field to kind of push the illustration into, uh, but we're really trying to push the students into that because uh, magazines and uh, different publications will ask for things like that. Like, here's the really nice editorial piece, but can you also make it, you know, blink or rotate or flip around or something? Yeah, so <laughs> just a little bit, and it's great to have that knowledge. It's not that hard to take that next step. Workbook or something, yeah. yeah. And then, um, I guess just doing the outreach, gauging how interested the artists might be. It varies by year to year that sometimes we might approach up to three and ask them to do at least two or concept rounds where we can at least 
<laughs> Let's get rid of that and put the, the real logo on there. Yeah, there was a lot of amazing merch. The little ornaments that came out of this that were hand painted was amazing. Yeah. It was very, very good. It worked like it was like it was inspired by so it was really awesome. So we are library librarians and archivists and curators. I would like to ask you how you are archiving your work <laughs> and finally as an educator, how what is your message to the next generation? Uh, a lot of this stuff is archived sort of digitally, but then I do print out a lot of these things on, you know, acid-free, pH-neutral paper, uh, the Jaclay prints uh, in a large-scale format, um, and then I keep those. Uh, but I have all this stuff digitally archived in a couple different places, so in case, you know, that hard drive is destroyed or that computer is destroyed, all that work is, is at least somewhere. Uh, the next generation, I would say, you know, keep working traditionally. Um, learn digital stuff as tools and start putting some motion into it uh, and there's such a wide range of styles and industries and places to be drawing especially in the illustration world um, that there's always some niche place where you can end up working and your stuff can be accepted and you know do well in the in the world Long, long ago, you mean from graphic design days? Right, right. Yeah, long, long ago. And I don't know if you have a background or not in graphic design or know anything. Uh, it was <laughs> computers had sort of just come out, like the little boxy Macs, you know, that were black and white screens. And so those were in another room. And like, we were, that was our goal was to get to these things. And so we had these pads of paper and we were like hand tracing typography. and putting glue on things and pasting things up and using markers and then once we got to, we could get to this black and white computer they couldn't do very much you know so that's where a lot of that hand done stuff for me at least comes from in those basic principles and then getting to the and I think that's a really nice way to go instead of just sort of jumping to the computer and like ha letting it do everything for you however you know you get on the computer and you can flip through a thousand typefaces in a second instead of looking through a book and trying to get some zip tone and you know scratch it onto the paper and go oh that didn't work and throw it away and move to the next yeah i know so there's there's a balance between the two so yeah it's definitely Thank you. No, thank you very much. Thank you for coming out. And uh, I'd like <laughs> you all make sure to stop at the Prince and Photographs Division. We displayed all the pictures, uh, the posters, which are uh, donated by uh, National Cherry Blossom Festival Inc., which will be around the corner if you exit this building, I mean this room to the right, and then make a one turn to the right. And on the door, LM337, you will see um, Thomas Burns, uh, like a 
flyer on the door, so you don't miss it. So please stop by. <laughs> Thank you very much it looks for coming similar today. To that. Yeah. Thank, you, Thank so you so much. Oh my God, that was so much fun. Yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.